Floor framing is done after the foundation wall has been completed. In platform construction, the floor unit is framed directly over the foundation walls or short stud walls used as cripple walls. Generally, floor units include beams, joists, bridging or blocking, and subfloor. Post and beams support the joists. Bridging or blocking keeps the joists aligned and helps to distribute the load carried by the floor unit. The subfloor is the wood deck that rests on top of the joists. The floor unit may be framed directly on a sill plates where we have a crawl space foundation and low foundation walls. In this case, one end of the joists laps over a beam. Posts and beams provide mid-support for the long span joists. Generally, there should be at least 18 inches clearance between the bottoms of the floor joists and at least 12 inches between the bottom of the beam and the soil. Cripple walls are usually used to create a crawl space or for a full basement foundation. Under the same condition, it is less costly to use cripple walls than additional concrete and form work required for higher foundation walls. Cripple wall studs are toenailed to the sill plate and they are commonly spaced 16 inches on center. Floor joists should be placed directly on top of the cripple walls. A stepped foundation is another example of where cripple walls are used to reduce construction costs. Posts and beams help support the floor joists and subfloors. Posts and beams may be steel or wood, and the dimensions and placement of beams are shown on a foundation plan. Wood posts are placed directly under the wood beam. Generally, the wood post width should be the same as the width of the beam that is being supported. For example, an 8 inch wide beam requires a 6x8 or 8x8 posts. The bottom of each can be nailed into a pier block that is secured to the top of the pier. Also, a half inch steel dowel can be placed in the concrete pier at the time the concrete is placed. The dowel fits into a hole drilled at the bottom of the post holding the post into position. The dowel should extend at least 3 inches into the concrete and 3 inches into the post. Fixed metal bases are placed when concrete is placed. An adjustable post base is placed after the concrete has set. A J-bolt may be set into concrete as it is placed, or a hole can be drilled and a threaded rod fixed into place with epoxy. Metal bases that are set into a concrete pier when concrete is placed. A wood post fits into the base and is secured to the base with lag bolts. No bolts or other fasteners are required to attach the base to the concrete. These bases must be positioned in the concrete very accurately. An adjustable or elevated metal base may also be used to support a wood post and provide moisture protection for the post by using a J-bolt set in the concrete when concrete is placed. Also, we can use a knife plate connector. These last two connectors provides a flat bearing area for the post and keeps it above the concrete surface to guard against wood rot and termite damage at the bottom of the post. The top of each post is fastened taut to the bottom of the beam. Angle iron or a metal connector is typically used to create a strong tie between the beam and post. Post caps are nailed or bolted to the posts and beams. The twin design post cap can be installed after the beam has been placed on top of the post since it is available in two pieces. Wood beams may consist of a solid timber, built up lumber, or engineered products such as glulam or laminated veneer lumber. A built up beam, for example, may be fabricated with two or three or more planks. Joints between the planks are staggered. When assembling a built-up beam, the joints of the planks should fall directly over a post. Three 16D nails are driven at the ends of the planks. Glulam beams or laminated veneer lumber beams are used for residential and heavy timber construction. Glulam and veneer lumber beams are flat pieces that are glued and pressed together under intense pressure. The ends of the beams may rest in pockets formed in the concrete walls. 
The end of the beam must bear at least four inches on the wall, and the pocket must be large enough to provide a half an inch clearance around sides and the end of the beam. Also, the end of the beam should be treated with a preservative to avoid termite damage, and the pocket lined with galvanized metal. Beams can be non-load-bearing, which are for cosmetic purposes, and load-bearing. Load-bearing beams must support a wall frame directly above, as well as the live load and the dead load of the floor. The dead load is the weight of the material used for the floor unit itself, and the live load is the weight of people, furniture, appliances, and other items placed on the floor after its construction. Steel pipe columns are often used as posts in wood-framed buildings and can be placed beneath either steel or wood beams. The base of a steel pipe column is bolted on the top of the pier or floor slab. The bolts holding the base must accurately set into the concrete during concrete placement. The cap at the top of the steel pipe columns is secured with machine bolts and nuts or by wielding when it is attached to the steel beam. Lag bolts are used when the columns are attached to a wood beam. A standard steel beam, called a wide flange beam, is commonly used with wood framing. Wood joists either rest on top of the beam or butt against the sides of the beam. Posts must be cut to length and set up before the beams can be installed. The upper surface of the beam may be aligned with the upper surface of the foundation sill plate, or the beam ends may rest on top of the walls. Long beams must be placed in sections. Solid beams must be measured and cut so that the ends will fall over the center of the post. Built up beams should be placed so that their joints fall over the posts. A half inch clearance must be provided at the ends of the wood beams to allow for expansion and contractions of the beams and to allow for air circulation. 1. Stretch line between walls. Measure down to top of pier. Subtract depth of beam from this measurement to determine post length. 2. Cut post and set it on top of the pier. Plumb post and secure in position with temporary braces. Three, place and fasten beam to top of the post. Floor joists. In platform framing, one end of the floor joist rests directly on the sill plate of the exterior foundation wall or on top of the plate of the framed exterior wall. The bearing surface should be at least one and a half inches. The size and spacing of the joists is determined by the span and weight of the load to be carried. The most common sizes used for joists are 2x6, 2x10, 2x12, etc. Floor joists are typically spaced 16 inches or 19.2 inches on center. The foundation plan usually specifies joist size, joist spacing, and direction that joists should travel. Floor joists are supported and held in position over exterior walls by header joists or by solid blocking between joists. Header joists, also called rim joists, run along outside walls. 16D nails are driven through the header joists into the ends of regular joists. Header joists prevent regular joists from rolling and support the wall above. Floor joists extend across the full width of the building. However, long joists are expensive and hard to handle, therefore shorter joists can be butted together and lapping over a beam or a wall. The minimum lap over a beam should be 4 inches. Solid blocking is installed between the lapped ends. When the ends of joists are butted over a beam, they should be scapped together with a metal or wood tie. The dies can be omitted if the plywood subfloor panels straddle the butt joints. Metal joist hangers are required when joists butt against a beam or ledger board. Joist hangers are metal connectors that when properly installed provide a stronger joint than nails alone. Joist hangers are available with galvanized finishes or a stainless steel. 
Joist hangers are usually face mount and top flange and galvanized nails should be used to secure them in place. Improperly installed joists may not be able to support anticipated loads and can result in floor squeaks. Often, wood floor joints are supported by a steel beam instead of a wood beam. A sill plate can be bolted to the dip of a steel beam. Joists are toe-nailed to the plate. The sill plate may be also attached to the steel beam with a powder actuated tool. Joists can be butted to a steel beam by wielding joist hangers to the upper surface of the beam. Hot dipped galvanized nails are driven through the hangers to secure joists in position. The joists can also be notched to fit and butted against the sides of the steel beam. 3 eighths of an inch clearance should be allowed above the top flange of the beam to allow the wood to shrink without splitting. In some situations, opposite pairs of joists are scabbed across the top with a metal tie. In addition, a wide plate may be welded to the bottom of the beam to provide better support. Cantilever joists are used when a floor or balcony of a building projects past the wall below it. For exterior load-bearing walls and roofs, one foot of cantilever is allowed per each three-foot backspan. For exterior wall balconies, one foot of cantilever is allowed for each two feet of backspan. A header joist is nailed to the ends of the joists. When regular floor joists run parallel to the intended overhang of the floor, inside ends of the cantilever joists are fastened to the double joists. Metal connectors are strongly recommended. Nailing should be through the first regular joist into the ends of the cantilever joists. A header joist is also nailed outside the ends of the cantilever joists. Bridging between joists keep the joists aligned and helps distribute the load carried by the floor unit. Bridging is usually required when the joist spans are greater than 8 feet. Joists with a 15 feet span need one row of bridging down the center of the span. For spans longer than 18 feet, two rows of bridging. Floor frames are bridged to prevent unequal deflection of the joists and help solidify the frames. Cross bridging consists of 1 by 3 or 2 by 4 studs installed diagonally between joists. These are toe-nailed at each end with 6D or 8D nails. The pieces are usually pre-cut on a power miter box or radial arm saw. The upper ends of the cross bridging are nailed into the joists and the nails at the lower end are not driven in until the subfloor has been placed. Cross bridging reduces the amount of floor deflection by spreading applied load. Solid bridging is commonly used in conjunction with cross bridging where non-standard joist spacing occurs. Solid bridging are wood members that have the same width as the joists and are installed in a straight line or staggered. Straight line bridging may be required every four feet on center to provide a nailing base for the panel subfloor. Solid bridging provides maximum rigidity to the floor frame. A floor opening must be framed where stairs rise to the floor. Fireplaces and chimneys also require specially framed floor openings. When joists are cut for floor openings, there is a loss of strength in the area of the opening. The opening must be properly framed to restore the lost strength as shown in the image. Various metal connectors may also be used to strengthen the framed floor opening. Before floor joists are placed, the sill plates and beams must be marked to show where the joists are to be nailed. Floor joists are usually placed 16 inches on the center. One method of laying out joists is to mark an X to indicate the side of the line where the joist will be installed. The first joist will be at 15 and a quarter inches from the edge of the building with subsequent joist spacing of 16 inches on center. The joists should all be trimmed to their proper lengths. The subfloor, also known as rough flooring, is nailed to the top of the floor frame. The subfloor strengthens the floor unit and serves as a base for the finished floor material. The walls of the building are laid out, framed, and raised into place on top of the subfloor. 
Plywood is the oldest material used for subfloor, but non-veneered panels such as oriented strand board and composite board are becoming more popular. When the panels are placed, they should be staggered. Subfloor panels may have square or tongue and groove edges. Blocking should be nailed under the long edges of panels if tongue and groove panels are not used. 6D and 8D nails and number 8 gauge deck screws are used for fastening subfloor panels to the joists. When all the panels are placed and roughly fastened, chalk lines are snapped to locate the centers of the joists below. The entire subfloor is then nailed in one operation. In some cases, a construction adhesive is used in addition to nails or screws for fastening the joists. Even though this is commonly called glue nailing, a mastic adhesive rather than glue is used. In a post and sub beam floor system, the floor unit receives its main support from floor beams rather than from floor joists. The beams are usually spaced 4 feet on center and are supported by wood posts resting on concrete piers. The subfloor panels are 1 and 8 inch or 1 and a quarter inch thick and they should have tongue and groove edges. 10D nails are common and spaced 6 inches apart. Floor truss systems are frequently used in residential and commercial wood framed construction. A typical floor truss is composed of top and bottom cords tied together by webs. The webs are fastened to the top and bottom cords by metal connector plates. Another type of truss design, floor trusses, have the advantage of covering long spans without requiring intermediate support of walls or beams. Also, the space between webs makes it easier to run pipes, electrical wire, and ducts. Floor trusses are usually spaced 24 inches on center. Wood eye joists are engineered wood products that are widely used in the construction of flat roofs and wood framed floor units. They are a high performance alternative to solid dimension lumber. They provide high bending strength and good stiffness characteristics. Wood eye joists consist of top and bottom flanges and webs that fit into grooves machined into the flanges. Flanges are dimension lumber or laminated veneer lumber and webs are plywood or OSB. Wood eye joists are manufactured in lengths up to 60 feet, eliminating joist overlapping at central beams or walls. A big advantage of eye joists is that holes may be drilled or cut into the webs to accommodate plumbing, electrical, and other mechanical systems. Top and bottom flanges must not be cut or modified. All the cuts must be made according to manufacturer instruction. Blocking is not necessary unless there is no rim board or header joists installed between wood eye joists supporting load bearing floors and between cantilevered wood eye joists. Wood eye joists are fastened to rim boards or other flat surfaces using top flange or face mount joist hangers. Backer blocks provide a flat, flush surface for attachment of top or face mounted joist hangers or other structural elements by filling the space between the outside edge of the eye joist flange and the web of the adjoining eye joist. The depth of the backer blocks should be approximately 1 8 inch less than the distance between the flanges. 10D nails should be used. Web stiffeners are dimension lumber. OSB or structural panel materials used to reinforce an eye joist web. Load stiffeners are installed between supports when significant load points are anticipated. The depth of the web stiffeners are 1 8 of an inch to 1 quarter of an inch less than the distance between the flanges. Bearing stiffeners are fitted tightly against the lower surface of the bottom flange. Load stiffeners are fitted tightly against the upper surface of the top flange. Filler blocks fill space between eye joists that are used as a single member. Filler blocks permit the vertical load to be shared between the two eye joists and force each joist to absorb equal amounts of the load. Filler blocks are installed the full length of the double eye joists, either as a single member or as shorter pieces. 
The depth of the filler block should be 1 8 of an inch less. Squash blocks carry a point load that would otherwise bear directly on a wood eye joist, such as when a post is installed directly over another post on a lower level. They are installed to allow even distribution load. They should be cut 1 16th of an inch longer than the eye joist depth to ensure the squash blocks provide support for vertical loads. I hope it will help you to do a better job.